All right. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about leading like David. As we've uh, talked about, as, as uh, Rod just announced, our lead pastor search is about ready to commence, and we're getting ready to get going on that. And, you know, the question is, what kind of leadership qualities would you like to see in the lead pastor? Well, I've kind of thought about that, and, and, and King David has kind of exemplified a lot of the leadership qualities that I personally would like to see in our next pastor. Now, this is just me talking. It's not the elder board or anything, so uh, if you don't like one of these, don't blame them. It's just my own opinions, okay? <laughs> so the first thing uh, I'd like to see, and, and Rod actually kind of mentioned this, is, is we want God's choice for the next pastor. Uh, and, you know, in David's life, uh, Saul was the king, and God rejected him, and and then he told Samuel, he said in, in 1 Samuel 16, 1, he said, how long are you going to grieve over Saul since I've rejected him from being king? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I'm going to send you to Jesse, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And so Samuel went, and he, he talked to Jesse, and Jesse started bringing his sons in front of him, the oldest first, and Samuel said, man, he looks pretty good. He looks like he might be the one. And, and God spoke to Samuel and said, you know, don't look at his appearance or the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. God looks on the outward appearances, or man looks on the outward appearances, but God looks on the heart. So I, we want God's choice. I don't want my choice. I want the, the one that God has chosen. But this next thing we want is someone who's got God's heart. Um, you know, in the, when Samuel told Saul that he had, the first time Samuel told Saul he'd been rejected he, uh, as king, he said uh, that, uh, let me get down here, my notes. He told him that, you know, the Lord has found somebody after his own heart that he's going to choose as king. And so we want as somebody who has God's heart uh, that who thinks about things the way God does, who has the passions God does, who thinks about people the way that God does. The next thing we want is somebody who's got God's anointing. Uh, I want a pastor who ha has a, who can look back to a period in his life in which uh, God made a change in his life, where he's, uh, something different happened to where he was different from that point forward. You know, we've seen this uh, in different leaders in the church. You guys, uh, this is a picture of, of, of Samuel where he anointed David. And some of the other people we can think of that we know of in life, Billy Graham, you know, he was, uh, he was a, a student at a Bible institute. And he was going around, he'd, he'd canoe across the river next to the Bible Institute over this island and he'd preached to the trees and to the alligators and stuff, trying to figure out whether he was really, whether this is really what he wanted to do. And he really wasn't sure whether uh, it was what God wanted him to do. And then one day he went out onto a, a golf green right next to the, the institute there and got down on his hands and knees and said, God, if this is what you want, if you want me to preach, you know, I'm willing. And something changed within him. And he knew at that point that it was God's will for him to preach. And, you know, many of you know the, the impact he's had through the many years of, of uh, bringing people to the Lord. Anybody here in the, in the audience who actually got saved at the Billy Graham crusade? Got one guy raised up his hand. I know in Sunrise, there was a couple of people a couple of weeks ago that mentioned they had actually gotten saved at the Billy Graham crusade. Another guy who, um, um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, there you go. Charles Finney. Um, was a great 19th century evangelist. And he um, uh, was, before that, he was an attorney. And one day he was in his uh, office as an attorney and the Holy Spirit just came upon him in this amazing way. And uh, he, he said it was just like waves of love flowing over me. He said, I just, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't hardly stand the power of God. And he was that way for several hours and then one of the guys that he knew from church showed up at his office and, and said, you know, are you okay? And he said, I, I'm okay, but I, I feel good enough to die or something like that. And so this guy left and went and brought an elder from the church back. And, and this elder is one of these guys who was very stately and never really had much of a, uh, 
uh, was kind of stern, and, and he started asking Charles Finley what had happened to him, and as Charles started explaining, this elder just burst over and started laughing and laughed continuously for a long time and couldn't stop. And then right after that, a young man walked in while Charles was talking to the elder, and he just all of a sudden repented of his sins and said, oh, I need you to pray for me. <laughs> and all, from, all of a sudden, uh, he had the Holy Spirit in his life. And, and Charles Finley quit his law practice and became one of the great 19th century evangelists. And uh, there was a temple that was uh, uh, created yeah, in, in New York, that had 2,400 people that was built just for him to be able to bring the gospel to people. So great anointing. And then, of course, what about Jesus? You know, uh, he kind of went along for 30 years as a, working as a carpenter. And then one day uh, he went down and had John baptize him. And, and as John explained it, you know, uh, the Lord told me that the one who the Holy Spirit came down on and remained upon, that's the one who's going to be baptizing with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so Jesus was baptized by John, and the Bible says, you know, after he got baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, and then as he got through that temptation, he came back uh, in the power of the Spirit. So I want, a, I want a pastor who's got the anointing on him and who can kind of point to a time and say, this is the time where I kind of felt God's calling on my, on my life. I want a pastor who's got supernatural strength. You know, David, he, he, uh, he killed the, the lion, and he killed the bear with his own hands, um, and uh, I, I want a I pastor who has the strength in which uh, he can, uh, knows how to battle the enemy and knows how to be successful in battling what God's, what, what the enemy is doing in his life, and he has strength to overcome uh, what, what the, the enemy has going on. Uh, I want a pastor who is able to accomplish much with little. Pastor, we accomplished much with little. Here's a picture of Catherine and I. A couple years ago, we got to go to Israel. And this is a picture of us on top of a, a hill overlooking the Valley of Elah, where David fought Goliath. And so if you see the hill behind there, that's the, uh, that's the other side of the Valley of Elah, where uh, the, the uh, Philistines were, were stationed and the, the Jews were stationed on the side that we're on. And down below there is the valley. And if you look there, you can kind of see the the little uh, stream going through there, uh, right, right there. You see that stream going through there? That's the brook where David went and uh, found the stones, the five stones that he picked up. And uh, David was able to kill the giant with just the anointing that he had from God and the five stones. Actually, he only needed one of the five. But, uh, so I want, a, I want a pastor that can accomplish much with little, just like David did. I want a pastor who's a warrior, who knows how to battle, uh, knows how to battle for the church, knows how to battle for truth and righteousness like David did. You know, one time Saul said, yeah, I'll give you my daughter, Michael, in marriage, but you got to go out and bring, uh, well, you have to kill 100 Philistines, I'll put it that way. Won't get, won't get too gory on you, but uh, so he went out and not only did he bring back 100, uh, did not only did he kill 100 Philistines, but he killed 200 of them. And uh, he had many other mighty exploits uh, as, as a warrior. So I'd like a pastor who's a warrior. Um, I'd like a pastor who sacrifices for others. You know, David, when he, uh, when he finally had to leave Saul uh, and get away from him because Saul was trying to kill him, the first thing he did is he, he went over to, to Gath over in the Philistine area and tried to hang out there. But the king was kind of worried about him because he had you know, killed Goliath, which was one of his guys. And so David feigned uh, being crazy for a while, and uh, finally he, he quit that, and he, he comes back and he hangs out in this area here in the, uh, the caves of Adullam. And, you know, it, so here he is trying to keep alive, okay? Saul's trying to kill him. He's trying to keep alive, and then what happens? Well, his family shows up. And his family shows up and, and want to be taken care of. And not only that, but it said all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their leader. So here you have, you know, a guy who's trying to just stay alive, and now he's got all these other people that he's got to worry about. But he was willing to do that. He's willing to take on the responsibility of, of, of his family and these other people. In fact, what he did, you know, he was sitting here in the cave of the Bedouin, and he took his family, his, his parents, all the way down here around the, the Dead Sea, all the way over to Moab, and, and left his parents with, with the Moabites because his dad was a, still a, was a quarter Moabite, 
And, uh, and so David took him over and, and, and let the Moabites take care of him. But he, he went all the way and did that. And then after that, he ended up, he and his motley crew of 400 distressed and losers, basically, were spent their time going back and forth through the wilderness of Judah trying to keep alive and, st- and uh, keep, not let Saul kill him. So I want someone who's willing to sacrifice like that for his people. <clears throat> the next thing I want is someone who will turn DDD into MM. DDD into MM. Well, as I read in 1 Samuel 21 earlier, as I mentioned to you, uh, you know, after his brothers came, there was also came to him were those who were in distress, in debt, and discontented. So how, how would you like to have those as people that you're leading? <laughs> you're trying to stay alive from Saul, and then you got these people showing up. But later on in, in 1 Chronicles, it talks about some of these guys, and what it talks about them is that they're mighty men. And it talks about some of the exploits of these mighty men of God. There was 30 of them. And they had kind of, they hadn't divided up. There was three that were really, really mighty. They were the top three. And then there was three under them. They weren't quite as mighty as the top three, but they were really mighty too. And then there were several others that, that made up the 30. And these guys were something else and uh, did mighty exploits for God. One of them was a guy named um, Abishai who actually killed 300 uh, men at one time. And another guy <laughs> killed a lion while they were inside a pit together. So these guys were something else. But I want a pastor that can take people who are in the 3D mode and turn them into, into mighty men and women of God. And, you know, I know a guy who came here about seven years ago. And uh, speaking of debt, he was, had $30,000 or so in credit card debt. He had two mortgages on his house that pretty much equaled the value of his house. Uh, he was a burned-out former pastor he had sin patterns in his life that hadn't been dealt with. He had, you know, the relationship with some of his kids was strained. And his faith in God in some ways was just kind of hanging like a thread. And, uh, and there was men uh, in this church that uh, ministered to this guy. Uh, Mike McGregor preached a sermon about dealing with shame in your life. And telling, telling people to, you know, you need to deal with it and come clean. And so this man went up to him the next week and said, man, I need to get in a small group. And so Mike McGregor said, come to mine. And so for the next several years, he and the other guys in the small group, Steve Quillen being another guy in that group, poured into him and gave him hope and prayed for him. Mike Milner looked at this guy one day and said, I see something in you. I see something in you. I'd like you to be be more involved in, in the prophetic team. Uh, rock bottomly looked at this guy and said, I see something in you, and encouraged this person to, to get more involved in the church and be active. Pat McTiernan saw this guy and said, I see something in you. Why don't you come and join the finance committee? And uh, all these, there's many other people that called this, called this person out. And uh, so this church already has this in their DNA. And I want a pastor who continues to build on this. So let me just encourage you, if, if you're one of these three Ds right now, you know, you're in, in distress or dead or discontented, I think you're in the right place. And uh, if you are, I'd appreciate, i just encourage you to let somebody know. <laughs> That's what I did. I finally said, I'm going to let somebody know this. And uh, God will turn you. I don't, I don't know if I'm a mighty man or not, but I'm a lot better than I was. That was me, by the way, that person, in case you didn't know that. Uh, I'm a lot better shaped than I was. <clears throat> I want a pastor who can make the tough decisions uh, in life. Uh, you know, David, uh, in, first, in Samuel, 1 Samuel 23, uh, there was a, a town that was getting attacked by the Philistines. And uh, so he went up to the Lord and said, shall I go and attack these Philistines? Well, the Lord answered him, go and attack them and save this, this city, Keilah, uh, I think is what it's called. But then David's, uh, but David's men said to him, hey, here in Judah, we're afraid. I mean, you know, they're afraid of Saul and everything. How much more if we go to Keilah against the Philistine forces? You know, we're trying to save ourselves from Saul's army. You want us to go, you know, <laughs> and let another army attack us? And so David said, okay, I'll go back and ask the Lord again. And so he went back and inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said, go down there to that town because I'm going to give it in your hand. 
And so David did, and God did do that. Uh, but, you know, sometimes we need to make tough decisions. There's going to be people around you that are going, are you sure you want to do that? I don't know about that. And uh, I want a pastor that's willing to say, yeah, God told me to do this. I'm going to do it. I want a pastor who's not a power grabber. A pastor who's not a power grabber. Uh, he, does, he, he doesn't grab power, but he waits for the Lord to give it to him. And if you look at David's life, he had a lot of times in which he could have grabbed the power. You know, when he was anointed initially as king, the Holy Spirit came on him. So, you know, God had rejected Saul as king and anointed him as king. So at that point right then, he could have gone up and, and said, hey, I'm supposed to be king now. But he didn't. He waited until the Lord made the proper time. And then there was two times when he was in Saul's grasp, uh, or Saul was in his grasp, I mean, and he chose not to uh, take matter into his own hands. One time was when David was up in En Gedi, and this is a picture I took when I was in Gedi a couple of years ago. This is some of the caves in En Gedi where David was hiding. Uh, here's another picture of it. And David and his men were up there hiding, and Saul was after him with his army trying to kill him. And uh, Saul needed to go relieve himself, it says in the Bible. So he went up into a cave, and it just happened to be a cave that David and his men were in. And so this is kind of what it looked like inside a cave. And so Saul lays down and goes to sleep, um, and David comes from the back of the cave, and there he is. Here's a picture of him uh, with a, Saul's picture of Saul's. He tore off a, he cut off a piece of Saul's robe, and all the men, you know, were like, hey, here it is. The Lord has given him into your hands. You know, all this time we've spent in the desert, we can be done with it. and We can now, we can now live the good life. And David said, no, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. It's not time yet. The Lord will take care of it. And then again, later, down farther south in the, in the valley of, in the desert of Ziph, uh, Saul was after David a second time. And uh, David and, and, that, and Abishai, the guy I was telling you about, the mighty man who had killed 300 people, well, they snuck down into the Philistine camp, and God caused all the Philistines to go into a deep sleep, and they were able to walk right into the camp and get right up next to Saul. And Abishai said, hey, give me one strike with my spear, and I'll take care of him. It's not going to take two. I'll do it in one. And, and David said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to wait. And even, uh, even when he uh, uh, was, well, even when Saul died, you know, he waited, and he let his own uh, tribe, Judah, make him king, and then it was not until about seven years later that he was actually made king over all of Israel, and it's when they invited him. He didn't force the issue. The other thing I want is a, uh, someone who has, whose fear of God trumps the fear of man, and I've kind of talked about it a little bit in, 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 in him not being a power grabber, but we want someone who, uh, whose fear of God trumps the fear of man. David was under pressure many times by his men and by circumstances to, to do things that God didn't want him to do. But his fear of God and his respect for God caused him to not do that, and he was able to uh, follow God's will. Uh, you know, one of the problems with Saul, his predecessor, was that his fear of man caused him not to fully obey God, and so that was what ended up causing him to be rejected as God's king. Uh, another thing we want is we want a pastor who is well prepared for the job. Um, David was really well prepared for the job. He, he initially was a shepherd, and that's probably about the best training ground you can have for leading people because, as God talks about, we're kind of like sheep led astray sometimes. Uh, but, you know, so he did that first. Then God caused him kind of supernaturally, uh, even though he'd been anointed as king, Saul ends up calling him into his court to, you know, play the harp for him whenever the... the the evil spirit came upon him. So he had an opportunity to see what it was like for, to, to, have, to run a kingdom. Just sitting there, watching from the side without any authority of his own. He got to see what it was like to run a kingdom. Then he got put into Saul's army, so he got to see what it was like to, to, uh, to, to fight as an army. Then he led, you know, the, he led those motley crew of the three Ds in the, in the desert for seven and a half years. Got a great experience from that. And then finally, he got to be a king over just his own tribe, Judah, for about seven and a half years. And then finally, after that, he became king of Israel. Uh, in, uh, other, other, uh, in contrast, Saul became king immediately. Uh, he, and uh, it's, it's kind of like winning the lottery. 
you know, you've heard of the stories of those who win the lottery. I mean, usually it's just a disaster because their lives aren't prepared for the new prosperity they have. And uh, so I think that really hurts Saul. You know, Psalm, or Proverbs 13, 11 says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And so I want a, 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 a pastor who's, who's gone through things that have prepared him for his new job. Next thing is I want a pastor who has a repentant heart, who's someone who uh, will listen to counsel and uh, will repent before making a bad decision. And an example of that is, is when David uh, was down in the south part of the, uh, down around Carmel, down south part of the wilderness, he and his men uh, were kind of protecting the, uh, the sheep and the, and the goats and the different uh, uh, livestock of a guy named Nabal, who was a really, really rich man down there, a big, big uh, stalker, stockman. And so they, they did this. And, you know, if you think about all these people trying to come up with something to eat and just survive. So he goes up to, to Nabal and sends some people and says, hey, you know, we've been protecting your sheep and not letting any robbers take them. And we haven't taken anything ourselves. You know, could you give us a little something in return for this? And Nabal was a real hard man. And he said, who is this David? I don't even know who this guy is, which is ridiculous because David was very famous. So, you know, he was just like, I don't even know who he is. And, uh, and he said, no, I'm not going to help him out. What does he think he's doing? And so the messengers came back and told him, and David just got, he lost it, lost it. And so he took all his men and said, I'm going to go make him pay for treating me this way. So he takes off and is getting ready to just lay into Nabal. And Nabal's wife, um, whose name was Abigail, uh, she hears about it. And so she puts together a whole bunch of food and goods and stuff and comes out on the road to meet him and says, I'm so sorry for my husband. You know, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's, he's a hard man. Would you please forgive us? And here's all this food. And David said, you know, you're right. I'm sorry. I was, I, I was overdone. And, and he repented of his anger and, and uh, went ahead and didn't take matters into his own hands and, and went against the will of God. So I want, a, I, want a pastor, I want a pastor who, you know, doesn't fear man, like I said earlier, but also is willing to, to listen and repent whenever he's not, not, not down the right road. So I, there's a nice balance there. I want a pastor who's lived through the desert, who's lived through the desert. You know, desert times teach perspective and sobriety and humility, gratitude, maturity. Here's a picture of, uh, I'm on the top of Masada, here, which is in the Judean wilderness, and just taking a picture of what it looks like in the Judean wilderness. And this is, this is what David had to live in for several years, and it's just barren. And, uh, but, you know, I want, I want a pastor who's had some times in his life where things haven't gone all that great, and uh, at least in the physical, but he's been able to see God work through that. Uh, you know, James 1 says, you know, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So if you want to be mature and complete, you can't actually even do that without going through some trials. So I want a pastor who's, who's gone through the trials and come out on the other side alive and well. <laughs> I want a pastor who values extravagant worship. A pastor who values extravagant worship. Here's a picture, and we sang about this a little bit ago. Uh, the song, you know, I will be, be even more undignified than this. Uh, when, when David was bringing the ark to Jerusalem for the first time uh, in 2 Samuel 6, 14, it says, David wearing a linen ephod danced before the Lord with all his might while he and his entire house of Israel brought up the ark with shouts and the sound of trumpets. And then as it entered uh, the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw him leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. And then when David returned home to bless his household, Michael said to him, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls and of his servants as would any vulgar fellow. And so David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone else from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. And then he said, I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, 
I'll be held in high honor. I want a king that has a heart like that. Uh, You know, when David completed setting the ark up in Jerusalem, he organized singers and gatekeepers to administer continuous worship at the tabernacle. There were singers or people playing harps, people playing lyres, uh, people uh, playing cymbals. And in, in the Bible, it said there was 288 musicians at the tabernacle, and there were 62 gatekeepers. So just think of the cost for paying the salaries of over 300 people just to worship God. Uh, I'm an accountant, so I added that up. Uh, If you assume an annual salary of $30,000 a person, that's over $10 million million in annual cost to worship the Lord. Okay? He appreciated extravagant worship. I want a pastor who feels that way. A psalm that David wrote that reveals his heart for worship Psalm 108, he says, My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all of my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. I want a pastor that feels that way. (laughs) I want a pastor who's prophetic. By the way, uh, on your little bulletin, those of you who are writing down, the last two need to be switched. So anyway, I want a pastor who can see and call out God's current and future purposes in people, places, and events. Uh, David was this way. David was very prophetic. You know, one example of this was him capturing Jerusalem and making it the capital and worship center of Israel. It was as if he understood that this this town, this area, was part of the strategic part of God's ultimate plan for Israel and for the church over time. You know, when the Israelites first entered the Promised Land hundreds of years before, they were never able to capture Jerusalem. Did you know that? It was never taken over by Israel. they, They couldn't capture it. Uh, the Jebusites controlled it. There's one, there's one scripture where it says the Israelites captured Jerusalem and burned it, but then a few scriptures later it said the Jebusites had control of it again. So it, they may have captured it once, but they couldn't hold it. But for hundreds of years, it was under the Jebusite control. And it was only, you know, Jerusalem was only about seven or eight miles from Bethlehem where David grew up. And so he knew about it and everything. And it's kind of interesting to think about what his what his thinking was and and what God was speaking to him about Jerusalem because it's interesting, whenever he killed Goliath, uh, he he cut off his head and guess where he took it? He took it to Jerusalem. That's all it says. It doesn't explain it, but it says he took that head and went to Jerusalem. So it was almost a strange prophetic act on his part, kind of telling the Jebusites, I'm coming (laughs) or something like that. I'm not sure. But anyway, then years later, when he became king over all 12 tribes, one of the first things he did was capture Jerusalem. And in in 2 Samuel 5, 6, it said uh, David and his king marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. And, you know, the Jebusites had held it for hundreds of years, so they were pretty cocky about where they'd be able to withstand the attack. And the Jebusites said to David, you're not going to get in here. Even the blind and lame among us can ward you off. That's what they told him. And nevertheless, it says in verse 7, David captured the fortress of Zion, the city of David. And on that day, David said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those, quote, lame and blind people who are David's enemies. So apparently he, he figured out some way to use a water shaft no one had ever figured out before and was able to get in there and capture Jerusalem. So, you know, that was, a, I think, a prophetic act on his part. He, he said in Psalm 132, 13, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here will I sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor will I satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints will sing for joy. So it was like he knew that this was God's plan. He had this prophetic understanding of that. And then in Psalm 110, an incredible prophetic psalm, 
in which uh, Jesus or uh, David is prophesying about Jesus. Psalm 110, he says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And the, he, he says, The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, which is Jerusalem. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. And then in verse 4, he says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, talking about Jesus, are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. There's a lot of rich truths in this. If you haven't studied the Melchizedek priesthood, I urge you to do that. You can go, there's three different places he's mentioned, one in Genesis and then here, and then in Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, really unpacks it. And so uh, there's some real rich, rich uh, truths about this. But the neat thing, he mentions Melchizedek, and Melchizedek was the, the, the king of Salem, or Jerusalem, who met Abraham on his, when Abraham was coming back from uh, rescuing Lot and looting the enemy. And uh, he met Melchizedek, and Melchizedek blessed him, and Abraham gave him a tenth of what he had, what he had received. And so it, it, Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which is the king of peace, and he was also the god of the most high. He was a priest of the god most, most high. So here you had a, a guy who was both a king and a priest. And so Jesus is also uh, a priest and king. So there was some real cool prophetic significance of that. And so David in Psalm 110 understood that hundreds of years before it happened. So I want a pastor who's like this, who has a prophetic understanding of the events and, and what people's callings on their lives are. Okay, so takeaways. First of all, we need to pray for our new lead pastor, right? Uh, pray for the pastor would have these, these, uh, these character traits that David had, um, you know, that we want to really pray that, that we, God brings the right one in. But secondly, I want to consider your own walk with the Lord. Um, the thought about where are you in, in leading like David led? You're probably leading someone right now, whether you're a father, a mother, a neighbor, a friend, or maybe in your job. Um, and God wants you to lead like David. You know, you know the old army uh, poster about, I want you for the U.S. Army? Well, I think God is speaking to me and to us as a people. God wants you to lead like David. You're probably leading someone, uh, like I said, in, in your, uh, as, a, as a parent, as a, in your job, or maybe friends that you have that look to you. Uh, God wants you to lead like David. He's looking for leaders who have his heart for people, who will perform supernatural exploits for him, who are humble and willing to sacrifice for those they lead. People who don't consider leadership an attained privilege, but an act of service to be performed for others. And even if you aren't leading anyone right now, you say, well, I'm actually not leading anyone right now. Well, I, I, I can pretty much guarantee you, if you implement these qualities that I just mentioned, these, uh, these 3D type people that are in distress and debt and discontented will start showing up at your door, looking for someone to turn them into mighty men and women of God. So... Uh, we want to pray that God does that. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for the examples that we have in the, in the Bible of, of godly living and godly attributes. And we first of all, I want to thank you so much for the qualities that you gave T King David that are still applicable to us today. We thank you for the anointing that he had upon him. And we know, Lord, that as we are men and women of this new covenant that you've given us, that uh, as we trusted in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that your Holy Spirit has come into us. And that just as the Spirit came upon David, we have that same Holy Spirit living within us. And so, Lord, we just declare that, that uh, the capabilities that, that were in David's life are attainable by us today. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us an increased level of faith that you would give us a desire to seek you and serve you so that we may be able to have the kind of impact that David had on those that he led. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who hasn't yet received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that you would uh, touch their heart and help them to see the, the incredible uh, blessing of 
giving their life over to him so that he can fill it with himself. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.